Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus channel. Submarines have been an official part of the United States military since the 1860s. When the Alligator-class submersible was introduced to protect the era's wooden ships. Since then, the country has had dozens of different subclasses, each more advanced than the last. Of course, just because a submarine is no longer useful in warfare does not mean it no longer has value. For decades, the U.S. has embraced a disposal and recycling process that allows it to get the most out of these ships before anything is discarded. The process consists of defueling and decommissioning, followed by hull salvage, and, if applicable, nuclear reactor disposal. It is a long and often time-consuming process, but it can ensure the military gets the maximum value from its dismantled ship. The USS James K. Polk was a Benjamin Franklin-class ballistic missile submarine, first commissioned in April of 1966. It was decommissioned in 1999 after more than three decades of service. The process began when the submarine was loaded into a dry dock at the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard in Washington. A dry dock is a long, man-made canal that can be flooded or drained to give workers access to all parts of a ship's hull. In the case of a submarine, the dry dock must be flooded to allow the sub to enter. This is normally accomplished with the help of several tugboats. Once in place, the gate on the dry dock can be sealed and the water pumped out again. Whether the crews are dealing with a ship or a submarine, the next step in the process is removing all valuable components and any items that may prove useful if they fall into enemy hands. Once the boat is stripped, the cutting process begins. Depending on the size of the submarine being dismantled, the hull will be divided into three or four large sections. This makes it much easier for the men and women working on the project to access the interior and disassemble various components. Throughout this process, the sub will sit on a set of rails at the bottom of the dry dock. This makes it easier for the crews to access areas under the submarine if necessary. The hull and interior are slowly taken apart piece by piece by using powerful cutting chains, cranes, and even handheld tools. Given the sheer size and weight of the materials being dealt with, it's essential that the parts be supported by heavy-duty pulley and chain systems. This is to keep parts from falling after they are cut away from the main section of the sub. The James K. Polk, for example, was 425 feet long and weighed more than 6,000 tons.
The ship submarine recycling program places a lot of stress on safety. Properly dismantling a large ship like the James K. Polk is already a major project. However, ensuring that all the different pieces end up in the right place explains why this project took a year and a half to complete. Since the early days of shipyards, heavy lifting cranes have played a crucial role in both ship building and dismantling. Even when cut apart, different components of a vessel can still weigh thousands of pounds. Moving them requires crane operators to sit hundreds of feet in the air and communicate with workers on the ground via walkie-talkie. Moving each component is a prolonged and deliberate process, as even the slightest wrong move could send it falling. This would not only risk the component itself, but the lives of the workers below. This crane operator is working Crane 4 at Puget Sound Naval Shipyard. Each load he carries must be secured to his crane using a massive locking carabiner system. Some loads will be placed on pallets, while others will simply use steel cables wrapped around the item itself. These massive shipyard cranes are movable, but the process is extremely slow. Each crane is constructed on a series of tracks that allow it to move forward and backward across the shipyard. This allows it to serve numerous functions throughout the day. While boats and submarines may be the largest military dismantling projects, they are far from the only ones. Indeed, as they age, suffer damage, or break down, aircraft of all sizes and types will also need to be disassembled and stripped of any valuable parts. In some cases, however, this must be done far away from any facility equipped for such an operation. This C-130 Hercules is being dismantled at a landing field just north of Baghdad in Iraq. Earlier in the week, it crash-landed in a field and was deemed unsuitable for repair. Without cranes and other heavy equipment, the bulk of the work must be done with saws, hammers, and rivet guns. Since it, too, has valuable equipment and technology on board, all the important parts of the C-130 will be transported back to a more well-equipped base for further salvage and potential recycling. The shell of the plane is then blown up in order to speed up the process further. This makes it much easier to section the aircraft into smaller pieces and then load it onto trucks for disposal. In the case of most military aircraft, dismantling is not an immediate process. After all, unlike ships, Planes have a variety of components that can be reused even years after the aircraft itself is decommissioned. From propellers and flaps to sections of fuselage and landing gear, having potential parts on hand can save a lot of time and money 
in the event an in-service aircraft needs repair. For this reason, many military and commercial planes end up at massive outdoor facilities known as boneyards. Many of these, like the 309th Aerospace Maintenance and Regeneration Group, are located in dry desert climates like the American Southwest. In these dry conditions, it's easier to reduce corrosion and the hard ground means no pavement is required. Still, it's imperative that these planes be protected from sand, sun, and time. They are often covered in a combination of spray lat surface protectant and plastic or rubber sheeting. For large aircraft like this, such a process can take nearly an entire day to complete. It can be difficult to explain just how massive these boneyards are properly. The 309th AMARC facility, for instance, contains more than 4,000 decommissioned aircraft in all. This facility was founded back in 1946 and has been collecting aging fighters, bombers, trainers, and cargo aircraft ever since. Despite the overwhelming size of the facility, there is a lot of organization required so that specific parts and planes can be found when needed. Generally, planes are stored by type and carefully cataloged. With the proper protective coating, the printed IDs on the tail and fuselage should remain visible for decades. The AMARG has a runway where decommissioned planes can have their last landing. Boneyards like the AMARG play a huge role in the aircraft preservation process. But that doesn't mean there aren't frequent demolitions on site. There are multiple storage categories at these facilities, and not all require the entire plane to be stored intact. For instance, Type 1000 planes are kept intact to the point that they can be fueled for takeoff with just a little bit of notice. In the cases of Type 4000 planes, which are labeled excess of Department of Defense needs, the planes are demolished and sold off for scrap. This is not as deliberate a process as what's seen with ships and submarines. In many cases, it is performed by a single backhoe and driver. Though the AMARG is an off-limits facility, other boneyards in the American Southwest accept visitors. This allows the general public to see decades-old planes up close and personal. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.